Right, Simon Fishburne for Drum Talk TV again at the Bonzo Bash and we're so fortunate to have Rod Morgenstein here and um, I was just like having a moment before I have a friend who's got a, a Stein at the end, Steen, I got a little confused but I got his name right. Rod, you got a story about that, tell us. Okay, you know how in the United States um, when, when a person has an ethnic sounding name and they're in show business they usually drop the ethnic part, right? So, um, uh, you know, so someone with the last name Morgenstein might drop the Steen and it would become Morgan. So, um, years ago, it was the mid 80s, um, I remember uh, when I showed up for the first time in a Modern Drummer magazine poll, uh, my dad said to me, Hey, have you ever thought, you know, now that you're kind of getting a bit of a name for yourself, have you ever thought about? changing your name, meaning dropping the steam. And I said, no, never really, never really occurred to me. I think I'm, I'm going to keep it. So um, shortly around that time, I ended up moving to Germany to play with a band called Zeno. The band had recently signed the biggest record deal in the history of the music business for an unsigned band. They had done a four song demo in the city of Hanover, Germany, and it caused a bidding war among Geffen Records in the United States, EMI England, and, and some other labels, and they ended up going with EMI, and they had four different, three or four different drummers and three or four different producers do the record, and they did it all over the world uh, because the budget was enormous, and then they held auditions in New York City for a drummer. And uh, I, w I won't bore you with the details of the audition um, process, but I got in the band and then I found myself living in Hanover, Germany. Now these three lovely guys spoke English to, d to varying degrees and um, one day somehow the conversation came up about names and, uh, and my name and I said, yeah, you know, um, when I started getting a little bit popular as a drummer, my dad asked me if I ever considered, you know, changing my name and these three German musicians looked at each other speaking in German and they turned to me and they said, what's wrong with Rod? <laughs> because you talk about how, th how humor or, or things in general don't necessarily translate from culture to culture. That's such a German thing, right? In Germany, the name Morgenstein <laughs> yeah. is cool sounding. It means morning stone and they have a very big band or they used to have a very big band called Ramstein, right? Or Ramstein. And so to them, there wasn't even a question that I would ever consider messing with Morgenstein. You know, so they thought maybe I was going to change into like Bill Morgenstein or, you know, Sanford. Or, or John. Yeah, something like that. Right. Anyway. Speaking of John, how the hell are you here? Like, I'm, I know, you know, you're here and, 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 and John's been a huge influence in your life and your playing and that sort of thing. Um, how, how did you get involved in this? I received an email a month and a half ago from Brian Tishy, who I had never met. Uh, I certainly know of Brian from all the things that he's done, plus um, Reb Beach, who is uh, the lead guitarist, or one of the two guitarists in my band, Winger, also plays in Whitesnake, and he and Brian became buddies when Brian was in Whitesnake. And so maybe, I think Brian got my email info from Reb. So he contacted me and I said, hey, yeah, give me a few days so I can check to see if uh, my schedule kind of works out. And then I was really glad that it did. And so here I am. Here you are. Here so, John Bonham, you're, I guess, I mean, from, from my upbringing and like my upbringing, my, my development in Australia as a drummer, knowing you and knowing about you, rock drummer, yes, but maybe more like fusion drummer. How does John fit into all of that? All right, when I started playing drums at 10 years of age, it was because I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was a variety show, a Sunday night show where America just shut down and everybody was sitting at their TVs, you know, to watch, you know, a comedian, a juggler, an animal act, a musical act, and then the Beatles' first performance in the United States was on the Ed Sullivan Show. And so it was a defining moment for me, I knew within a minute what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so um, 
you know, from that point on, like I was, I was completely hooked on rock music. Now, in my home, my parents were very, uh, you know, into the arts, and we lived not far from New York City, so they would take my sister and I to Broadway shows and to see orchestral um, concerts. But you know, I was a typical kid growing up in suburbia in America, and so it was the Beatles, and then two years later. You know, Cream and Jimi Hendrix came on the scene, so then I was totally into them. A couple of years after that, Zeppelin and Jethro Tull. Yep. And then, you know, the, then the floodgates were open. And so I was just consumed with rock music. Uh, but at the same time, my parents hooked me up with a big band drummer who became my private teacher. And so he was teaching me all the ins and outs of playing the drums, reading music, the rudiments, snare drum material, and playing along with big band music, at, uh, uh, along with learning how to read big band charts. So I was doing the whole rock thing in my uh, other time, and then preparing for my lesson doing the jazz thing. Um, and so I was clearly into the bands that were leaning a little bit more towards the progressive end of things, like Jethro Tull. And you know, even though Led Zeppelin is just this hard, slamming rock band, there, there are so many interesting musical elements in the music. That, totally. that definitely fit into the progressive category. In fact, the thing to me that makes them so wonderful is that when, when they play music that's in a time signature other than 4-4 four, four time, the casual listener wouldn't necessarily even know it because the riff came first and then figuring out what it was came later, if yeah. ever. It all felt good, it all sounded good, right. and that's it, right. It, wasn't, it all came it, from the feeling just Jimmy Page writing a riff. It wasn't, right. ooh, I have to write something right. in an odd time signature. Right. Which I'm always going to guitarists and stuff like that. Don't do it for the sake of doing it. Like, if it feels good, do it. Like, it's got to come from that, that place. Um, do you think, because John didn't have any formal drum lessons or training, but he was very much influenced by the jazz idiom, uh, do you think that's, did you, did you feel a connection to him and his playing because of that? Um, I would say not knowingly at the time, now yes, okay. because I'm a little bit more studied and you know, 40 some odd years down the line. Um, but the thing is, you know, if you think about it, back in the early days of rock and roll, there were no rock, rock and roll drummers because there was no rock. And so all the musicians that started playing rock jazz. were either jazz musicians or blues musicians. Right. And all of that music has swing. Yeah. To it, yeah. and so if you listen to like you know Elvis Presley records, even when when they're doing like a do 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 do, you can hear a little bit of bounce in it. That's what makes a lot of the music from back in the '50s and early '60s yeah. so interesting and feeling so amazing. So the whole the the, the straight eighth thing of just do do ba do do, that didn't come back then. It came some some time later, and that's yes. Uh, John Bonham clearly has swing in his rocking. And so, as I got a little bit older, when I was at the end of my teens into my very early 20s, um, a musician who I was playing with turned me on to a band called the Mahavishnu Orchestra. So, okay, so you had Billy Cobham playing drums, John McLaughlin, a jazz guitarist and guitar, Jerry Goodman, a violinist, and uh, Jan Hammer, this unbelievable jazz uh, keyboardist. They came from a jazz background, but they, they cranked it up. John McLaughlin plugged his jazz guitar, or he picked up a Marshall, and uh, uh, um, a Les Paul and stuck it into a double stack Marshall. Didn't know. Stick Billy on the drums. <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden, you had you know, the, the pure energy of rock combined with the intricate melodic and harmonic tendencies of jazz. And the music that came out of that I think influenced me almost more than anything in my life. And so at that point I was in college and uh, I was like, I got a degree in what's called studio music and jazz, a four year bachelor's degree. And so for those years I drifted away from the rock realm and now I was in this jazz rock fusion arena where I became one of those snobs that looked down his nose at rock thinking it's so archaic and anybody could do it because you know, to listen to an ACDC song, you know what everybody's doing. Careful. I'm, I'm talking... Oz, Ozzy, Ozzy. Hey, I understand. That's why I bring it up. That's my man. Th that's... I'm just being honest about what I became... Or the period yeah. that I went through and who I became. Right, right. And um, 
And so then, I, you know, my first band was the Dixie Dregs yeah. with Steve Morris on guitar, and we continue to do that band when our schedules line up. But yeah. so what happened was when the Dixie Dregs and then the Steve Morris band came to a halt in the mid 80s, I had a decision to make, like, am I going to stay in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was living, or do I move to a big city and try to figure out my next move? So um, my parents and sister were still up in the New York area, so I moved back here and started pounding the pavement in New York City, trying to figure out the next thing to do, which was, I want to get back to my rock roots. And so at this point, um, it was around that Zeno, experience and uh, I was you know kind of a well-known drummer at that time so it wasn't difficult for me to to sit in on jam sessions or, or meet musicians in New York City and 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 some of them were really excited to jam with me because they were big Dixie Dregs fans right, right. but what would happen is I would sit in and then I'd hear the bass player go you know dong, 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 dong. so I'd kind of slam it out you know playing one of the you know most basic rock grooves uh, for maybe two seconds, and then I would start doing fusion, break up the time, play over the bar line, polyrhythms, blah, 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 which at first these musicians were into, right. but then I wouldn't go back to just the pure rocking it out. Right, and right. and uh, at one point, one of the musicians pulled me aside and said, Rod, you don't get it. And then I was thinking, excuse me, <laughs> you're a rock musician, you're telling me I don't get it? Like I had an attitude. I, I, this, this, these were my thoughts. It wasn't. I would never talk to somebody that way. But my thinking was, you're joking, right? Like what you do is so simple. But what I learned, um, because fortunately I decided to try to put my ego aside and try to see if there's something that I truly am not getting. And there was a lot. And and in a nutshell, it's that there's a reason that different styles of music sound the way they do. And it's because they all have their own elements, their own special ingredients that make them sound that way. And ACDC sounds like ACDC because every guy in that band is doing exactly what needs to be done to make that music sound so incredible. And so if you put a fusion drummer into ACDC, who some people would say, oh my God, he's a way better drum, you know, no, he's not a way better drummer. He's a fusion drummer that right. does what he or right. she does. Great, but he has no clue how to lay it down in ACDC. And there's there's this thing like when you listen to a jazz drummer just try to play, <clears throat> it doesn't have attitude. It sounds like a jazz drummer trying to rock. And so, so the lesson that I learned was, all right, Rod, you... When you're going into a rock setting, you gotta park the fusion stuff at the door, and you're going into space to play a special thing. You're gonna use these ingredients. You're not gonna use the ingredients of jazz. You're gonna use the ingredients of this particular genre within rock. Right. And had I not had this experience when a year later I auditioned for Winger, I would never have been asked to join the band. Wow, there you go. Yeah, so now. So now I've come full circle. You have. Uh, We've all come full circle. Are I am you still following. What a story, man! I love good music, and you know, pick a genre, and there's good music and crap music within every genre. Right. You know, I love the blue. I love the blues more than anything, and right. I, you know, like when Zeppelin does does that the acoustic stuff. You know, like with uh, with you know, um, a pedal steel and stuff. I melt. You know, I'm, I'm all, at this point in my life, I'm all about the song, and I'm all about melody, and I've, I've started to become uh, interested in lyrics, because that's another it's thing. in your old age. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, but it's a good thing. It's like you're maturing, and musically, you know, you've got the technique thing down, which a lot of people out there know, know you to be, um, a technical fusion drama that's got your stuff down. Um, but it's just wonderful hearing you talking about this sort of thing that, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people out there, they, they poo-poo you for, for like being so up there and snobby and stuff like that. But now it's just this, you've, you've come full circle. It's wonderful. I'd have to say, uh, the, the most, um, satisfying 
aspect of my career has been uh, trying to, um, you know, live up to each band that I play in and play for that style of music. So with the Dixie Dregs, it was the instrumental jazz rock fusion thing. With Winger, it's hitting the drums harder and rocking out. But in Winger, you know, there's a progressive element in the band where another part of the reason that they asked me to join is so that in a song like Headed for a Heartbreak at the end, they say, do the fusion stuff that you would never hear a rock drummer do because it'll make Winger um, stand a little bit apart from all the other bands right. in that genre. But in addition to that, you know, I have a power duo with Jordan Rudis, the keyboardist from Dream Theater called Rudis Morgenstein Project. And so that's over the top, crazy, progressive rock. But then from that, I have the Jelly Jam with Ty Tabor from King's X and John My Young from Dream Theater, which is more like, you know, power muso pop, where it's the song, and we try to um, throw little interesting musical elements in it that you might not hear in just a straight ahead power trio. And then beyond that, I also play in a jam band called Jazz is Dead, which just jams on the music of the Grateful Dead and kind of takes it to a different place every night. And that was a thrill. It was, it was kind of scary, but thrilling joining that band because Billy Cobham was the original drummer. When he left, I was asked, and another amazing drummer, Jeff Seip, um, to each take turns being the drummer in that band. Then we did a tour as a double drummer thing, and then Jeff bowed out of it, so I became the drummer. But the bass player in that band for the first few years was Alfonso Johnson, who I used to go see when I was really young, watch him play yeah. in Weather Report and the yeah. Billy Cobham George yeah. Duke band. And go, oh my God, when I grow up, maybe I could play with him, you know? And so there I was in Jazz is Dead. Yeah, yeah.